Hello there, AP Chemistry. We are continuing our discussion on chapter four today. We're gonna to talk through precipitation reactions. This is the second type of reaction that we have talked about within solutions. So again, remember the big um, categories of solution of reactions in solutions would be neutralization reactions, which we talked about last uh, video lesson, precipitation reactions, which we're talking about now, and then oxidation reactions, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. So <clears throat> with precipitation reactions, um, this would be uh, a double replacement or sometimes a single replacement reactions. When you have a precipitate formed, um, what happens is two solutions are mixed. Those two original solutions have ions that are dissolved and floating around in them. And when those ions are allowed to mix, some of those ions combine to form insoluble salts or sometimes slightly soluble salts. And so that insoluble salt uh, forms a solid <clears throat> And that is what we call a precipitate. Um, so these actually, the reactions are not too um, groundbreaking, might be the term I'm looking for. Uh, they're not very novel to us. They're something that we dealt with heavily in chemistry last year. Um, we spent a lot of time in chemistry with identifying and predicting the products of a double replacement reaction. Well, that's exactly what this is. The only step up we have for AP chemistry is now <clears throat> instead of telling you um, what is aqueous and what is solid, or instead of asking you to use the solubility chart. Now, sometimes you have to recognize what is soluble and what is insoluble. And again, to do that, um, you need to have some of the solubility rules memorized. And it's going to be the first verse, basically, on the solubility song. I'll play that again for you. So you know exactly what part of the song you need to have memorized. Sodium and ammonium salts, whatever they may be. Ooh, got excited there. Okay. We're by Cornell University Chemistry Department. Potassium, sodium, and ammonium salts, whatever they may be, can always be depended on for solubility. When asked about the nitrates, the answer is always clear. The H and all are soluble is all we want to hear. That's what you have to know. So basically, you have to know that... Oh, no. Go back. Sodium and ammonium. I want that first verse to show up. Here we go. Okay, so any salt that contains potassium, sodium, ammonium, or nitrate is always going to be soluble. So you need to have that memorized. Um, and then outside of that, you need to be able to use the solubility chart that uh, in order to predict what kind of things are going to be solid versus what kind of things are going to be aqueous. So remember, anything you're going to label as aqueous would be a soluble salt along with strong acids, strong bases. Um, anything you would list as a solid is going to be uh, an insoluble salt and also usually the slightly soluble salts will get listed as solids also. Okay, now... Um, when you are predicting the products in a precipitation reactions. Uh, if you have a product that shows up as a solid, then you 
conclude the reaction is going to happen and um, we can write products out for this. If you mix the ions initially and nothing comes out to be a solid, they all come out to be aqueous, they're all soluble salts, strong acids, strong bases, then you're going to com conclude that no reaction actually occurs. Um, because if we put ions together, if we mix ions together and they don't actually interact, then it's not a chemical reaction. You have not caused a chemical reaction to occur. And we're not going to write out the products as if the chemical reaction does occur. Um, <clears throat> so how do you predict whether a precipitate will form in a reaction? Again, this comes down to a couple things. Um, products are super hard to predict whether they're actually going to form or not. Also, the states are very hard to predict. So you either need to have prior knowledge, um, also known as like experience with the compounds, or you need to rely on those solubility rules. Um, okay, so let's kind of look a little bit more deeply into one of these. So here's an example we have here. We have potassium chromate mixing with barium nitrate. Now notice these are both aqueous. So if we look at the beakers, we actually have in our first beaker, we're not going to have any potassium chromate. We will have potassium ions and we will have chromate ions floating around separate from each other. So again, we write it as a compound um, when we write out the complete molecular uh, formula, but they don't actually exist as compounds. In the second one, in the second beaker, you're going to have a beaker full of barium, two plus compounds, and NO3 minus nitrate ions. Again, floating around, not interacting with each other. Now, how do I know that they are soluble? Well, because they um, include potassium and nitrate. And whenever those two are in your salt, it's going to be a soluble salt. Okay, <clears throat> so we can rewrite this equation like this. And this shows what's actually in solution. This would be the complete ion or complete ionic reaction when you actually list out what's actually there instead of listing it out as molecules. Um, usually you're going to see it listed out as molecules. This is a much more common way to write the reaction. Just because it's condensed, it's easier to write. It takes less symbols. It takes less time. And if you are, if a chemist is looking at this reaction, they're going to understand that you don't actually have the molecules there, you have the ions there. But until we kind of get our brains functioning in that direction, it is helpful for us to write it out as things actually appear. Now, <clears throat> remember, in a double replacement reaction, you're going to have the positive ion for one thing attracted to the negative ion for the other thing. So let's look at what kind of um, what kind of products could actually form. So potassium is your positive one. Potassium, is it going to be attracted to barium or is it going to be attracted to nitrate? Think about the ions that form. Barium is a two plus. Is a K plus going to be attracted to a two plus? No, they're both positives. Um, that attraction is not going to happen. K plus is going to be attracted to the NO3 minus. So one of the products you're going to get could be written as N, oops, we're going to write the positive first. K, N, O, 3. I'm thinking about charges. I'm balancing those charges with my subscripts. Um, <clears throat> But KNO3 contains potassium and nitrate, so this is going to be an aqueous compound. And in my products over here, if I'm writing what actually is present in solution, I would write K plus and NO3 minus separately because they are going to stay as separate ions floating around because it is a soluble salt. 
Now, the other thing that could possibly form would be your chromate, your CrO4 2 minus. Your 2 minus, is it going to be attracted to your barium 2 plus or to your NO3 minus? Now, a 2 minus is never going to be attracted to a minus, right? Negatives don't get attracted to other negatives. So the KRO4 2 minus is going to be attracted to the Ba2 plus. And so in your, um, in your molecular form over here, you're, you would get BaCrO4. Okay, and I'm thinking about the charges, 2 plus, 2 minus. I'm balancing those in the subscripts. Um, now BaCrO4, um, if you look on the solubility chart, you're going to find that the, this is going to be an insoluble salt. And so we're going to write it as a solid in the actual, when we mix the beaker of all of these four ions together, these two ions are going to attract each other. They're going to combine and form a solid and they will move around together as a molecule. Um, and so on the bottom here, we would write this BaCrO4 as a molecule stuck together. Uh, we would not write it as separate ions because in our final form, they are not going to be separate ions. They will be a molecule together. So we can see here, here's our complete ionic or complete ions written into an equation. And now we can look at this and cross off spectators. So take a minute. Maybe pause the video, identify where the spectators are. And hopefully you have recognized that potassium is a spectator. Nitrate is a spectator. Chromate has changed form. Barium has changed form. And so my net ionic equation would be Ba2 plus CrO4. 2 minus BaCrO4. There is your net ionic equation that we have predicted. We just predicted that uh, it's a double replacement reaction. It starts with two ionic solids. We have predicted um, the products that it will form, that it will form an uh, one salt that will be aqueous and one salt that will be solid. So therefore, we have concluded that a reaction will occur and we can write products out for this. And then we wrote it as a complete, um, as a set of complete ions. We wrote it as uh, a reaction with molecules. We wrote it as a reaction with a complete set of ions, and then we wrote it as a net ionic equation on the bottom. Okay, remember um, in, in any solution, whether it's one of the original two solutions or the final solution, if anything's an ion, those ions are going to move independently from another. If anything is a molecule, solid, liquid, or gas, molecule, it's going to operate as a molecule. Those ions will be stuck together and their, be, their movement will depend on one another and their properties will have completely changed into a new set of properties specific to that molecule. Okay, so that seemed like a lot of information on one slide, but almost all of that is review from chemistry. This is what we did last year in chemistry. The only new part is that you need to have that first part of the solubility song memorized and be able to apply that to precipitation reactions. That's the only new thing. Otherwise, it's completely the same as last year in chemistry. Now, we will do um, a precipitation lab. It's it's another type of solution analysis called gravimetric analysis. And we will talk about that once our titration lab is done. So at this point in time,
All we have left to talk about are oxidation reduction reactions, also known as redox reactions. So welcome, welcome to redox reactions. Okay, so here's the deal on oxidation reduction <clears throat> reactions. These, uh, so we talked about the five different types of reactions, right? Combustion, single replacement, double replacement, synthesis, decomposition, right? Now, redox reactions can be any of those five. They fit within those five reactions. It's not a sixth type of reaction. It duplicates in one of those five. Um, but the, the reason redox reactions are special and they are set apart, and we're going to talk about them as if they are a separate type of reaction, is because they involve uh, a transfer of electrons. And this is what makes them this whole big, beautiful, special category of reactions is because whenever you have reactions where electrons are transferred, you can get that transfer of electrons to move through a wire. And whenever you have electrons moving through a wire, what do you get? You get electricity. And so these are electricity producing reactions. These reactions can also be forced into a specific direction by using electrons using electricity to drive the reaction backwards. And so they blow up in this huge uh, category of industrially significant reactions. Think power, think batteries, think electricity. All of these are driven by oxidation re reduction reactions. So let's kind of talk about, let's pick this apart and talk about what they are. All right. So uh, in a redox reaction, you have an electron transfer between ions. Um, usually what you have is a metal that loses electrons. Remember, metals are this big class of um, elements that are fairly stable, and they have this really unique structure to them where they are covered by a sea of electrons, right? And because they're covered by the sea of electrons, they share these electrons really well. And that sea of electrons becomes mobile. It can shift and move very easily. Metals also tend to be very low in electronegativity, which means it doesn't take a whole lot of... Um, of energy to steal the electrons away. There's not much uh, power there to hold the electrons onto the atom. So they have very low electronegativity. They have very low ionization energies. And so usually it's these metals that lose electrons. The electrons get pulled off of these metals and then they transfer to a different ion. These metals then become a cation, um, and, and when something loses electrons, that's what we call oxidation. Now, there's uh, a couple ways to help you learn, help you remember what's oxidation and what's reduction. So you can either remember Leo the lion goes grr. So loss of electrons is oxidation, gain of electrons is reduction. That is my favorite way to remember uh, this concept because I think Leo is a cute name for a lion. You can also remember oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. Um, not quite as cute of imagery, but still very effective. There's a million of those, so you can go Google them if you want and then pick your favorite. Okay, so we can see an example down here. We have a calcium metal, and that calcium metal becomes the calcium ion, which means that this calcium has given off two electrons. So where do those electrons go? Well, if you look at the hydrogen, you see your example, you see your answer. So we have an H plus and that H plus becomes an H with no plus, 
which means hydrogen has gained two electrons and there we see the transfer. So calcium gives up two electrons to these two hydrogens, which then gain those two ele electrons and they both become something different. So calcium there has lost electrons, which means this is oxidation. H hydrogen here has gained electrons, which means hydrogen has been reduced. All right, so this is a really big skill. Um, the skill would be, can you identify what is oxidized, what is reduced? Um, and can you tell me where the electrons start from and where they go to? Um, so this is a similar reaction. Um, you can see it's not quite as obvious because those ions aren't listed for you. Come on, little buddy, behave. All right, so here's another example, not quite as obvious because the, um, the charges aren't listed for you. But here you can see calcium starts as an element, which means it has no charge. It is neutral. And then it ends up in a compound, and it's an ionic compound. And so in the ionic compound, we know there are charges. There, it, Calcium has a charge inside this compound of a 2 plus. Oxygen also has a charge within this compound of a 2 minus. And so if calcium goes from a neutral state into a 2 plus state, that means the calcium has lost electrons. Oxygen goes from a neutral state as well to a 2 minus state. That means oxygen has gained those electrons. So even though it happens within a reaction, um, within a compound, you can still pull that compound apart to evaluate the charges that are inside it. Now, this is a really common form of oxidation reduction, um, and that is oxygen stealing electrons from something. And so um, this is why it's called oxidation, because for a long time, they thought that oxygen stole electrons, and that was the definition of oxidation. It was oxygen stealing electrons. Well, come to find out, the more we can kind of dive into this, oxygen's not the only one who can do this. There are other um, elements and atoms that can also steal electrons. So now oxidation refers to just the gaining or the, I guess oxidation would be losing electrons to something, whether that something is oxygen or not. Um, and this is what rusting is. So if you have iron and the iron comes in contact with a source of oxygen, it's going to rust because oxygen steals electrons from iron and iron turns from elemental iron into an ionic form of iron, like iron oxide, which is rust or iron two oxide. Um, and so this is what we see when things rust or when things corrode. This is the exact process that is occurring. Um, okay, so at this point in time, I think we just should jump into oxidation numbers. So um, again, in that second reaction example that we saw, some, sometimes those charges are not apparent. And actually, there are other times where there's not charges there at all. And so what we need to do is we need to be able to assign what we call oxidation numbers. Now, oxidation numbers can represent an actual charge that is present, or it can represent um, kind of a a method of bookkeeping so that we can keep track of where electrons start and where electrons transfer. Now, even though oxidation numbers don't represent actual charges, they do represent actual electrons transferring. Um, if you look at the difference between an oxidation number and a charge, if we're writing something like oxygen, I'm going to write oxygen 2 minus. That means it's a charge. If the number comes before the um, symbol, it's going to be a charge. If I write something like O minus 2, 
that would mean that it's an oxidation number and not a charge. So it's a very simple um, way of flipping the notation that has a pretty significant um, meaning behind it. Now, it's not super critical that you are able to write the charge versus the oxidation number. Um, but I tell you this just so that you know, like, hey, there is a, a rhyme and a reason to why we write charges in a certain way. And this is the rhyme or the reason. This is why it's in, why, you know, every time I write a charge, I write it a specific way. Now, outside of that, you really don't need to know the difference between like the actual nomenclature or how you write the charge versus the oxidation number. Um, they're not ever going to take a point off of you on a test for reversing the symbol and the number. Not in this case, at least. So now you know, you're welcome. We can move on, right? Okay, so uh, there's a couple rules to establishing oxidation numbers um, that help you figure out where these electrons are and where they travel to. So let's talk about what those rules are are most of the rules are super straightforward and if you were to guess as to what the like charge or hypothetical charge is you would probably guess these rules correctly a bunch of these you could probably make up yourself for example for anything that's in elemental form like the calcium that we saw on the other page or the elemental oxygen that you see on the other page, um, all of their oxidation states are going to be zero. They have no charge. They are neutral elements. And so their charge would be zero, while their oxidation number is also zero. For monatomic ions, for anything that is just a one atom ion, whatever their charge is, is also going to be their oxidation state. See, I told you, you could have made these up. Uh, just make sure you get that plus or minus correct. Don't tell me it has an oxidation state of two because I'm not gonna know if that's a negative two or a positive two. So you, you always have to specify what, if it's a positive or a negative, make sure you do that. Also, um, don't just, on the flip side, don't just tell me it's a positive or it's a negative because I won't know positive what? Positive one, positive two, positive three, right? Make sure you specify both the symbol and the number. Okay, um, now we get into some usuallys. So oxygen is usually a two minus, right? Oxygen's charge is usually a two minus oxygen is usually going to have an oxidation state of two minus unless it's in one of its really strange forms. So we talked about its strange forms a little bit ago. Um, we talked about when, when like oxygen combines with alkali metals and alkaline earth metals. So do you remember these other two ions that oxygen can form? Uh, might be worth pausing the video and seeing if you can come up with, okay, oxygen can form an oxide and what else? And hopefully you said it can form a peroxide, which would be, uh, that ion would be O2, 2 minus. And so in the peroxide form, oxygen is going to be, um, a one minus charge instead of a two minus charge. Uh, there's, there's other cases where oxygen's oxidation state, um, oh, we won't, hold on. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, the other weird format that oxygen can form is a superoxide. So a superoxide is O2, one minus, that's a superoxide uh, ion. And in a superoxide ion, the oxygen would actually have an oxidation state of half, negative a half. But uh, I don't think you'll deal with that 
in oxidation reactions. We never deal with superoxides in class. They're way too reactive. And so uh, you, they won't put them into, into like a test question because it's something super odd that acts like an exception. And that's not usually the examples that they pull for test questions. Okay, so that's oxygen. It's usually two unless you're gonna deal with a peroxide. You might come, up, come across like hydrogen peroxide. It's a pretty common molecule, maybe sodium peroxide. Um, there's not too many other peroxides you're gonna fall, you're gonna come into. <clears throat> okay, hydrogen. Hydrogen is another super common um, form, super common ion that you're gonna find. Uh, and hydrogen, especially in like acids, right? Hydrogen's kind of define an acid. So hydrogen is usually a plus one, right? That's, that's how we see it. And just like uh, hydrogen, we talked uh, last unit into the, about the exceptions that hydrogen can form as well, right? What is the, <clears throat> what is the ion form for hydrogen that's a little weird? And hopefully you said it's a hydride, right? So remember with some of the alkali metals, hydrogen can form this hydride, like NaH would be sodium hydride. And in that case, hydrogen takes on a charge of one minus. Well, in that case, it would also have an oxidation state of one minus. Um, fluorines, always negative one. Other halogens, usually negative one. Um, it can be forced into another charge if there is something that takes precedence over it. Like in certain oxy anions, if you have like chlorine, chlor, perchlorate, for example, um, oxygen in perchlorate is going to have a two minus charge. Well, that might force some of the other elements to have um, strange charges that they, strange oxidation states that they wouldn't actually hold as a charge. So it's possible, um, but it's not very common. And we'll look at some of these examples in just a minute. Okay, rule number four, uh, the sum of all oxidation states of all the atoms in a compound is either zero if it's a neutral compound or it's the charge if it's an ion. Okay, so let's break that apart. For example, if we have carbon dioxide, okay? So we're gonna have a carbon plus an oxygen plus an oxygen. Well, the oxidation states for all three of these things should add up to whatever the charge of the molecule is. And in carbon dioxide's case, it's a neutral molecule. So all three of those charges should add up to zero. If we were talking about an ion, on the other hand, like hydronium, hydronium has one, two, three hydrogens and one oxygen. So the charges on all of those ions should add up to the charge of the ion as a whole, which is one plus. So as a whole, the ion is a one plus charge. So all the atoms or ions inside of it should add up to that final charge as well. Okay, so four rules. And like I said, you probably could have come up with these rules yourself, right? They're pretty straightforward. They're fairly logical. So let's try to um, apply some of these and you'll see, you'll see uh, how they kind of pay off for you. All right, so we're going to find the oxidation state of sulfur in all of these compounds. So when we evaluate this, um, we're really kind of living and dying off of that fourth rule that everything inside the compound needs to add up to the charge of the compound. So in H2S here, the H 
the H and the S, the oxidation states of all three of these things, they are going to add up to the charge of the whole molecule, which is zero. It's a neutral molecule. They should all add up to zero. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, apply the rules for the really common ones first. So remember, elements are zero. Uh, oxygen's usually a two minus. Hydrogen's usually a plus one. Uh, halogens are usually a minus one and then any ion is whatever the charge of the ion is okay so let's look at these um, between hydrogen and sulfur hydrogen is by far the more common ion now hydrogen is not with a metal in this case it's with a non-metal so hydrogen is going to have a charge of plus one well we don't know what sulfur is, but we do know the whole thing has to add to zero. So we can use our high quality algebra skills and solve for sulfur in this case. And in this case, sulfur is gonna be A minus two. And that's the oxidation state of sulfur in this compound. Let's look at the next one, S8. So S8 is the elemental form of sulfur. So sulfur in this case is just going to be zero. Now you can go through this process and do the same thing we did on the example above. And you can say, okay, well, S plus 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 S is going to be zero. So all the S's should be zero. But it's much faster and simpler to say, well, elemental form, it's automatically just zero. All right, let's look at the next one. So sulfur and chlorine. So we're going to have sulfur plus chlorine plus chlorine. The charge on the whole molecule is zero. So what is going to be more common, sulfur or chlorine? And chlorine is your halogen, so that's going to be more common. So let's give chlorine a charge first, and that means sulfur must be a two plus. Notice the oxidation state of sulfur in this molecule is different than the oxidation of, of sulfur in the first molecule. Um, and what you'll see, this is a really good example of the fact that in these two cases, um, sulfur is not an ion. It's not an ionic compound, right? It's a covalent compound. So in both of these cases, there aren't real charges in the molecule, but real electrons still can get transferred out of this molecule or into this molecule, depending on what reaction it's a part of. And so this bookkeeping system helps us to determine where those electrons really are and where those electrons really are going, even though there's no charges in here. So that's why we have to be able to assign these oxidation states. They are not pretend charges. They are bookkeeping for real electrons that can produce real electricity that really charge your cell phone in the morning. So you, you, know, you want to know these oxidation states. You want to love these oxidation states. Okay, let's look at the next example, a little more complicated. Sodium, sodium, sulfur, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. Now you don't actually have to write it out like this if you don't want to. You can write two times something plus sulfur. Oh, I guess sulfur should be a something also. Plus sulfur plus three somethings is gonna equal zero. Um, okay, so oxygen is gonna be the most common. Let's give that an oxidation state first. Then probably your alkali metal uh, and notice this is an ionic compound. We have an ion here and we have an ion here. So sodium's actually going to have a real charge in here of one plus. So we're going to use that actual charge. Now SO3 is the ion, right? SO3 is the ion, not S and not O. Between sulfur and oxygen, these bonds are covalent. But between the ion of sulfate, 
and sodium, this bond is going to be ionic. So bonds between sulfur and oxygen are covalent. Bond between sulfate and sodium are going to be ionic. And you'll have two of those. I just kind of ran out of space here. So it's, a, it's kind of a complicated little molecule. Um, and as a result, sulfur is not going to have a typical charge because it's not really uh, an ion in here. It's part of an ion. So let's do the math to figure out what the charge of sulfur, what the oxidation state, sorry, oxidation state of sulfur would be. So we have a six minus here. We have a two plus here that gives us an overall charge on the left of a four minus, but it has to be zero, which means sulfur has to be, have an oxidation state of plus four. Whew. All right, so now we get to look, oh yeah, sorry, this was not a sulfate molecule, it was a sulfite molecule, my bad. Okay, so now we look at the sulfate molecule down below. So similar thing, sulfate is an ion it's going to ionically bond with a metal or a cation for that matter. But the bonds within sulfate are not ionic. The bonds within sulfate are actually covalent. And so we can't just look at charges of sulfur and oxygen because they're both nonmetals. They're not actually going to have charges. We have to look at the oxidation states. All right, so we have sulfur plus four of oxygen, and that's going to equal the charge of the molecule as a whole, which is two minus. Now oxygen is probably gonna act pretty typically here, so it'll have, we'll give it an oxidation state, here I'll write it as an oxidation state two of minus two, since we just talked about how it does not have a charge. Okay, so negative eight on this side, negative two on this side, that means sulfur must be a positive six. All right, so different charge of sulfate every single one we looked at. And that gives us a good practice of applying those oxidation state rules and drawing conclusions from them. We will look at these problems in class together and work through them together so you can have some practice um, working through this.